The question is, do you agree that Scotland should be an independent country? For me, the principle that we work best when we work together. Well, they didn't. Very serious. The referendum. It seems to me that they're not dealing with the issues. Hello and welcome to Scottish Independence podcast number 24. Although I say it's number 24, but if you add up all our episodes and our little specials and the For All That podcast, this is actually the 50th podcast. And it's quite a surprise that we've done so many so quickly. I'd just like to say thanks to all the people who listen and all the people that are helping us get it out there. People like Bella Caledonia have supported us, all the people that give us tweets and put it on Facebook and everything. And thanks very much for that. And also thanks go to the people who have donated a little bit of money to help us just keep the project going. In a special nod back to our earlier episodes, I'm recording this on the crappy microphone of my computer because I forgot to bring the decent headphones with me today. OK, so to this episode. And for this one I spoke with Stuart Braithwaite, who's the guitarist in Mogwai. Mogwai, who are a band I'm sure most of you have heard of. So um, we'll just go straight to the conversation and I'll have a wee word with you at the end. Uh, hello Stuart, how's it going? Very well, Michael. How's yourself? Ah, not too bad. Uh, looking forward to Workers' Day tomorrow. I'm going to have my own shirker day in protest by being a total layabout and watching uh, daytime telly, I think. Uh, okay, fair enough. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's usually something good on in Kelvin Grove Park, but uh, there you go. Uh, okay, so I suppose the first question I'd like to ask you is um, when and why did you come to the idea that independence was the way forward? Because, you know, for a lot of people it's very different. Some people have a very pragmatic vision of it and some people have a more kind of romantic idea of it. Um, so when and why did you come to that idea? Well, uh, there, there wasn't like a eureka moment. I think it was really a sort of gradual chain of events over quite a few years. Um, a lot of my family are pro-independence, but I don't think I was very political myself really when I was a teenager or even when I was quite young. But when I think about it, there was a few things that happened that that kind of made me come to believing that it's definitely the way forward. One was um, the Iraq War, which it could just get the feeling that the people of Scotland would never have sanctioned. It just wouldn't have happened if we were in control of foreign policy and our own government. It was a very different mentality. Mm -hmm. And the other one, the the other one was was just travelling a lot. When we started the band, we'd, we'd go away on tour and we'd go to all these places and everywhere had its own identity and every, everywhere had good things about it and bad things about it, but it was very different. And I think having come out of Scotland, I didn't travel a lot apart from holidays when I was young, having come out of Scotland and coming back to Scotland, I realised that Scotland is very different. Scotland has its own great things about it, it's not so great things about it, and really... And I don't mean this in a negative way, but I genuinely just don't think that we are the same country as the other countries in the United Kingdom. I think the United Kingdom is um, its really the remnants of an empire. And when Scotland got its own parliament, I think that Scotland became a better place. I think that all of the governments have done their best to improve the lives of the people of Scotland. And I just think that the next step is for that parliament to become a 100% parliament rather than a 70% or an 80% parliament as it is at the moment, especially considering that the 20 or 30% that is still being controlled by Westminster are doing things that I don't think that, given a choice, the Scottish people would would endorse. Things like the bedroom tax, things like the foreign invasions, you know, I'm not saying everything the Scottish Parliament does is great. They've made mistakes as well. But I don't think that the ideological direction is different to that of the Scottish people. And I think that, yeah, that's basically it. Yeah. So um, to come back to something you said there, you think that um, independence is carrying forward. Its, uh, sorry, uh, devolution's got its own momentum. It's kind of that, that idea that once the genie's out the bottle, which is what a lot of... Uh, London Labour politicians were afraid of once the genie's out of the bottle, there's no stopping it. Well, I'm not so sure about that, actually. I think I think that the acid test of that will be the, the referendum, because I think there's an argument, and it's quite a strong one, that the success of the Scottish Parliament is actually a bit of a impediment to independence, because I think that 
I mean, you can never believe polls, but the independence was polling stronger pre the parliament. So I think that maybe people were thinking through grievance that we should have our own government, whereas now they're doing a pretty good job. So you kind of worry that the inherent cautiousness of the people up here might lead them to think, oh, well, everything's all right. Why change it? Rather than look what's happened so far. We're doing a bit better. We can do a lot better. Um, I guess that's the argument that's got to be made. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting position because the polls are still showing that people will vote SNP in a Scottish parliament, but uh, independence not quite as high as the SNP. It's, uh, they seem uh, divided what they want to do for the Scottish parliament, what they want to do for Westminster or for the constitutional position. Well, it's a real, it's a real conundrum because what you must have is people that don't think that highly of the Labour Party who are only voting Labour in an attempt to keep the Tories out at Westminster elections. But then those same people, there must be people who think this, who think I will do anything to vote against the Tories, but won't vote yes to make the Tories not our problem. Hmm. So I think that just has to be an argument to be made. Yeah, I think those are the people we've got to convince. But um, So that, that could bring us round to the campaign itself. And um, you've been involved in some ways. There's a nice picture of you signing the Yes Declaration, which I might stick on the publicity post for this pay, for this uh, podcast. But um, So what's your involvement in the campaign been so far? It's not been huge. I've had a few meetings and I've kind of been to, been to a few meetings with other kind of people in the arts and... I've met up with a few of the organisations, organisers, sorry, of the Yes campaign and kind of given them some ideas and offered to do what I can. But I can't say it's been it's been a massive, a massive involvement. Have you got anything coming up in the future? I've, no, I've nothing in my diary, but I've, I'm absolutely sure that I will be more involved in the campaign, certainly as as it gets nearer to the referendum. I mean... I kind of I keep saying to myself, especially on Twitter and things like that, to stop banging on about it because you're actually just going to turn people off. Um, but then the next demented lie comes out of the no campaign, and you kind of have to have a whinge about it. But I don't know. I I I do. I worry about people people who are very passionate about it turning people who who are people who need to be convinced away from it. Mm. If you know what I mean, like turning them off the debate by, I don't know, people who have definitely voting yes, arguing in angry terms against people who are definitely voting no and the other way around, I think is kind of pointless. I mean, there's some people, there's some people you're not going to change their minds um, mm-hmm. and really you're just affirming what you believe and what you believe about other people. And um, I don't think that that's very helpful. Um, but then again, people get so passionate and there's so many people that this is what they're, they've been fixated with this for their whole life. So you can't really blame them for this happening. But I do worry about that. And if when the momentum should be convincing people who are not sure to vote yes, you're not going to convince people who've got Union Jacks and Labour logos on their Twitter avatar that they're going to vote yes. You know, it's yeah, just... It's true. Yeah, you're you're just I don't know. You're just pissing in the wind. But sometimes it's difficult, as you said, uh, not to react to the latest demented lie. <laughs> I'd have to agree with that as well. Yeah, well, I mean, even I've been shocked by the Better Together campaign. I have to say, the just the negative negativity, the hilarious interpretation of the truth. Did you I, see? Did you see Truth Team? Ah oh, yeah, I mean that's just that's just Orwellian, isn't it? It's just brilliant. But um, I suppose that these things have to be confronted. But I almost wonder if trying to battle things out via the media is the right tactic. I think that the media's the media's an arm of the state, really. Um, still so much control, so much so much of it coming from London. You're not going to get a lot of joy there. So I think really. People talking to people, convincing them why they think it's a good idea, why they think it's going to help the country, why they think it's not going to doom England to perpetual Tories, all this stuff. I mean, my girlfriend lives in the northeast of England and a lot of the people I've spoken to there think that it would benefit them because it would it would take it would decentralise London 
the 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 benefits of Edinburgh becoming a real capital would filter down to them. They're actually quite excited about this. And also Scotland being generally left much more left leaning than England and hopefully being a bit of a beacon of things working well and people having good lives and things being a bit better, people being a bit less greedy. Yeah. That that will hopefully reflect on our neighbours. You know, I mean mm-hmm. so so many things that are portrayed as negatives in my eyes are positives. Yeah, I mean, it really could be uh, something that's for the benefit of everyone on the islands. Yeah, without in, a doubt. In general. But um, just to come to your position a little bit, as a member of the music industry, I don't know if you like that way of putting it, but... Um, it's a sad fact of life. Yeah. Okay, I'm not comparing you to these people. Please don't think that I'm comparing you to Bono and Geldof. But, like, when political people get involved, uh, uh, when, when music industry people get involved in... Um, political arguments there's usually a lot of uh, shit that starts to fly you know yeah. what what he's not got any right to talk about that and he should uh, he should shut his mouth personally i think everyone's got the right to talk about those things but at least you should try and talk sense and most of the time in my opinion bono and geldof are full of it and then they mm-hmm. a lot of the time they do more harm than good uh, but I mean, do you get? Have you had any adverse reaction for even the few statements you've made? You know, you said you don't want to annoy people and stuff. Yeah. Do you get any kind of? You should keep out of it. It's none of your business, sort of stuff. No, I've not really. Certainly not from a point of view of you're a musician. Why should you be talking about that? I mean, I've had people that have disagreed with what I've said, which I'm not surprised about. I mean, I do have quite forthright opinions on things, but um, I guess I guess it really depends on the. The platform and the context. I mean, I think a lot of people complain about Bono is that he kind of hijacks his own concerts and turns them into sort of rallies for various causes. And I mean, I've heard this from U2 fans. I know people who just are saying, oh, I just went to hear the music and suddenly it was like a the Bono party pro- broadcast. Uh, and certainly considering when we play, I'd probably say about four words during the entire gig. I find it unlikely that the next time we go on tour, I'm going to start giving diatribes. But <laughs> no. yeah, I, I, I've, I've, I've not had a hard time. I, I mean, to be honest, if someone actually just said to me when, listen, you're the guitar player on an indie band, why should I really care less about what you say? I'd probably say fair enough. But if you're going to say that, you have to say that about everyone. Why should you care about what everyone says? Because really, at the end of the day, unless someone's the, the prime minister or the first minister or the president, really... Does it care? Does it really matter what anyone says? <laughs> yeah, well, that's what bothers me about Bono. One minute he's talking about, you know, we have to do these things to uh, improve the situation in Africa and so on, and then the next minute he's doing cosy cuddle-up photos with Bush and Clinton. It's, wait a minute, those people are the cause of the problem, not the solution. You cannot ask those people to fix the problem that they're creating. But anyway, sorry, diatribe. That's me. That's me on a diatribe now. I, uh, I, I agree with it. I agree with it. I also, I also remember reading about their sort of tax haven status from Ireland and thinking that was not the coolest, but... Credit cards to save Africa. I mean, good. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, okay. So well, on, another thing along the lines of the industry, because it's something um, we've spoken about with uh, various writers that we've had on before about, you know, there's a kind of stigma. If you write in Scots, it's perceived mm-hmm. as vulgar and it won't be commercially viable and you, you cannot... You cannot do that. You cannot sing in that way, and you cannot use your own language. I mean, have your group had any uh, problems along this line? Well, I mean, most of our music's instrumental, but we do sing sometimes. To be honest, I think I don't have a very thick accent and kind of be reasonably well spoken as, as you are yourself. So when I actually sing, I don't have a very thick Scot- Scottish accent. In fact, I've had the piss taken out of me by Aidan Moffat for sounding posh when I. No, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> when I sing, but no, I don't think so. But I think that that situation, that kind of shift from the pro- the proclaimers singing in a Scottish accent and everyone thinking it's genuinely hilarious. I mean, you're roughly a, probably the same age as me. I mean, people used to laugh at that. That was yeah, fun, I, I laugh out loud, laugh out loud, funny that these, these guys singing in a Fife or Leith accent, or I'm not sure where they're from, but. That's actually changed to the point where I think you would find it hard to be taken seriously now if you didn't sing in a in your own voice. If you and sing I, sort I, of Midwest American accent, nobody takes you seriously now. Yeah, I mean I'm a massive fan of the Jesus and Mary chain, but I think what a much better band they'd 
be just saying that he's got bright accents. And I think that that can be seen as a as something that kind of goes along the line.